Nerd Alert! Property Nerds, <laughs> the home for data-driven property investors, where we uncover Australia's hot and cold markets, latest headlines and trends. Good day, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Property Nerds podcast. And today we're doing something different. We're at the studio here. Got the, the blue light and the TV, the, the brand of the Property Nerds. It's all, it's all popping off. But today we've got something even more exciting than just a bunch of cool mics, headphones and studios. We've got another joining us on the show as a host. So um, as you know, for those who've been following the podcast for some time, uh, my name's Arjun Paliwal. I'm the founder at Investigate Buyers Agency. And my wife, Lee, um, she was prior uh, looking after Hills Finance and working with us here on the Property Nerds podcast show. And so we had property and finance all come together. Now, during that time, uh, I welcomed uh, little Ruby to the family. So beautiful little Ruby. Uh, she turns one actually next week. So time is flying. And uh, during that time, Lee made the decision to go, look, I'd love to be in a, a full-time mom. And I'm really, really excited for her. Very happy that she's also, also doing that. And uh, it, it's definitely been a blessing. Uh, but during that time, I became a loner on the show. It was, it was just hmm. me, myself and I, and uh, trying to record some content for you all who tune in to share what I see in the data, share what I see out there in the headlines. And during that time, uh, we connected with you know the broker that we work closest with in, at Investing Advice Agency in terms of you know our clients raving, raving fans for this person and their team. And uh, yeah, from all sorts, complicate, complicated loans, expanding and scaling portfolios from five to 10, resi and commercial. We just had a lot of good momentum together and that was really special. And so I thought, hey, we want to keep the property and finance theme alive at Investigit and at the Property Notes podcast. And that was really important because we got loads of messages going, guys, can we have some finance info back again? Can we have some finance insights back again? And I'm like, yes, 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 coming soon. And we have that today. So um, I'd like to welcome my new co-host and the eggs still match, by the way. So for those who remember the eggs, the brown and white egg, I'm still the brown egg and we, we've got another egg with me. So my fellow egg, <laughs> Jack, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for the kind words, mate. It's, it's <laughs> funny, man, because I actually, how I first got to speak to you was through this podcast. It was about three years ago. I don't know if you remember, yeah. but I put an inquiry and you were releasing something where you'd put in a postcode or a suburb and it'll just give you mm. all the data. I, I heard the podcast, logged on, put my details in to get access and you called me. I felt like a celebrity was calling me and I was like, <laughs> couldn't believe it. But yeah, since then, it was. It doesn't feel like that long ago, but started sending you business and since then we've just been leaps and bounds, mate. So Yeah, it's been a special last three years, mate, just seeing firstly you go from strength to strength mm. um, our clients together share a very special journey. And I think like that's really important for me in what we do as a buyer's agency. When we help so many families, it's about not just us, it's about building the right team. And when you build the right team around someone, you get to see the good finance professionals, the not so good, the ones that had the clients delay their finance clause extended multiple times, mm. those that couldn't help someone get a loan through when they were clearly in the capacity in a position to, and you see it all in my space. So like to be able to isolate one person who I see as an absolute standout in comparison to the hundreds and then not only have you work closely with our clients, but to get your ass off the couch and go, mm. mate, come and join us on the show and you accept yeah. it. I was, uh, I was humbled on that as well, man. So welcome, welcome onto the show. But for those who don't know you, obviously I'm, I'm raving, raving fan of you, how you do business, how you help people, the family's lives that you transformed. Yeah. I mean, for those who don't know you, Jack, tell us a little bit about yourself business you're from just so people yeah. can get get to know you better yeah so when we first started working together it was at a different business but recent about a year ago now which is pretty crazy i started four acre financial yeah and uh mate it's been going very well and that's due to your support largely so thank you for that but um i think yeah well i started off as a broker about 2018 and yeah at the new business four acre financial we're just mainly focusing on building the team because I find that being the owner of the business, the people under you kind of follow your lead and they they know that I really care about every single deal that goes through. So everyone in the in the business is the same and you know, that's that's just how we do things. But yeah, I think in the last three years is really when I've started dealing mostly with investors. So mm. and over 90% of our clients are investors and the ones that aren't investors, 
would become investors because they're so confident. That's a really important point because when people are growing a portfolio, people don't recognize that brokers aren't all built the same. No. Right? Like you you go at it and look at Australia's data. Mm. Almost more than three quarters, like almost three quarters, sorry. Yeah. Of Australian houses are owner occupied. Yeah. So it's likely that the majority yeah. of financial financial professionals are 100%. dealing with owner occupiers. And, and we got a lot of people that come through to us and say, look, we've we've had a broker, but we just don't get the vibe that they know investments. And it's not just about lenders, it's mm. strategy. You've got to understand strategy. You've got to understand trust structures. You've got to understand SMSF because if you don't understand the full picture, you're not going to be able to give the right strategy that's individual to that client. And and they can, they know that, they're talking to you, they're not stupid. They know if you know what you're talking about. And, you know, yeah, I find that for us, when they do come, they very rarely leave. Like mm. people have their own reasons. People, you know, they have close people that they get referrals from, but we find that, you know, we've, we've got a really good business and yeah, it's, it's going really well, very happy. Yeah, and I think one thing, just to like make one final note on this all is that when I've seen your team in action, one of the biggest things I've seen is that, yes, you talked about the whole holistic part of SMSF, commercial, residential, helping from all sorts, but like there's no, this is a hard no. Like there's always, there's a way. And what I mean by <laughs> yeah. that is like, people sometimes treat mortgage finances, no, declined, approved. And you don't look at it that way. You're like, hey, I can make it work here. Yeah. Or if you have this change, we can make it work in the future. Yeah. It's like just solution driven. Where did you get that from? What's made you feel like that stood out about you and your team a lot? Cause it's very solution driven. Yeah, well we've, uh, I find it very hard to say no to a deal. Very, very hard to say no to a deal. Almost, I don't think I've ever said no to a deal because- It's like, give me a crack. <laughs> yeah, well, even when, um, and a lot of brokers, they put it in the too hard basket and they just say, nah, it's, you know, can't be done. And we actually get, because you you guys don't send all your leads over. You know, you, you have people that you work with. You have, you encourage people to use their existing professionals because it's yeah. a team that they've got. And I actually like that. But every now and again, there'll be someone that's bought a property and they're in the finance clause and they're a week out and their broker stuffed it up and we get a call and say, oh, so-and-so we've got a week. <laughs> You're on my emergency <laughs> lighter. <laughs> like if someone, someone calls me and goes, Arjun, I know I'm meant uh, to have this approved by now, but my broker has something like, look, I've got the Batmobile, or the, what do you call it? The Bat Batman's phone, the red phone. I got yeah, that yeah, I got yeah. that ready. Just stop doing it on Friday afternoons. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Just don't make Friday <laughs> afternoons any more stressful than they need to be. But you know, we have to get from within a week, we have to fully onboard investors that have, you know, multi-property portfolios and turn around a solution and a formal approval within that time frame, and try to find out what the issue was with their previous broker. And you find that during that process, um, I, to, towards the end, we're like, so have you spoke to the broker? Have they told you what happened? What, why it was declined? What the mistake was? I think a lot of them are just too ashamed to admit the mistake that they made until we've actually picked it up and go, okay, this this is very obviously what happened and why mm. it's failed. And this is why it has to go and, and get done this way. And, you know, very rarely we, we get a scenario like that and we can't do it, which just goes to show that not all brokers are created equal. I agree. Well said. Well said. Now, uh, that's you on the finance front. Mm. What about you outside of finance? I mean, people know me from the show because yeah. I've, I've been, you know, obviously here from the start and they've been following me. You're the new guy to the show, man. Yeah. Tell me a well, bit about yourself outside of it. Yeah, well, I'm still pretty young, so I like to get into sport. Um, we actually share a love for UFC, so yeah. I, I like to train in MMA outside of that. And um, recently I did a, a, it was like a promotion that gets you off the couch and into the gym and actually get into your first fight, which is something that I've always wanted to do ever since is I was- Is that one of those like corporate fighter, like yeah. those type of stuff? You see a lot of corporate boxing ones, but you yeah. don't see a lot of MMA ones because I think it's a little bit more brutal. Yeah. But Ever since I started watching UFC in my early 20s, I just really wanted to get into the cage. But to actually get into the cage, you've got to be really dedicated and, you know, cut weight and, you know, go and fight someone who's an absolute beast. But at least with this this promotion, it's like, it's kind of getting you off the couch and other people that are in similar situations, they're not, they're not you know, want to be like really top level fighters. They just want to you know, do it because they're a fan of the sport and, mm. you know, it gets them healthy and training. And 
I found that that's what it's doing for me, man. And well, as soon as I saw that footage, I was lucky enough to realize, all right, I'm never going to mess with Jack. I'm not going to have an oh, argument man. with you. And like, you know, even before, even after the um, the UFC stuff, not UFC, look at us calling you yeah, UFC. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'll be in the contender series before the UFC. <laughs> I promise everyone who's like, who knows I'm a diehard UFC fan as well. Yeah. Um, this isn't rigged. We didn't select Jack upon his UFC <laughs> credentials. Uh, the the main thing I wanted to point it out is I remember seeing a photo of you and I messaged you about this. I was like, I saw like 20, like six foot to six foot five Islander dudes, mm. as strong as muscly as they get, yeah. massive guys in the footy squad. Yeah. And then I see this guy in the back, <laughs> only white guy in the team, right? Yeah. And I'm seeing that, I'm like, okay, this guy's legit tough because there was no one else like that was anywhere near a normal person size other than you sorry if i've offended you by no, calling you normal true. person size but mate you pack a punch dude you nah, pack a punch yeah. well i was a i was a runner growing up in school and uh, you know grew up in Campbelltown and played footy since i was five years old so in that area playing for eagle st andrews you know it was it was like five minutes away from claymore so there was just a massive islander population and obviously in footy you know, most rep teams that I played for going through school, I was one of the two white people that were in the team. <laughs> and it was just because I had a lot of history in running. I, I went all the way to the top level, number one in Australia for a couple of years in 400 hurdles. So chuck me on the wing and I was one of the fastest Off on running. the field. Yeah, there's that, that's all I'm good for, mate. I'm not going to pretend <laughs> like I'm a great footy player, but I'm a one trick pony. Put me on the wing. If I get a bit of space, I'm I'm good. Oh, so you're you're hunting down that white sideline yeah. as soon as someone's getting close to you, like, oh, yeah. oh, and I slipped. <laughs> but Just, look, <laughs> mate, um, epic to know a little bit more about the other side. Look, I, I've gotten to know you closely as a friend for many years, but um, for those joining this show and maybe it's the first time, or even actually you've been tuning in for some time. The next three, six months, Jack and I are going to continue to regularly be on it. Not just three, six months, ongoing. But the next three months in particular, please pay attention to these shows because you're going to get a lot more deep dive into finance, a lot more of like, you know, policy outcomes, uh, interest rates, what offers certain banks are doing. Because I think many brokers put their cards too close to the chest in the yeah. hope that someone reaches out to them. That ain't Jack, no. right? Jack will tell you how it is. He'll tell you throughout the podcast episodes that we have more and more about what yeah. we see out there in the market. Um, but today, mate, we've got a bit of research to go mm. through. And that's something that, you know, this, this show is known for, like people want to nerd out with us, right? All yeah. data stuff, finance, property, um, interest rates, hot topic. So we've just released a research paper. And this research paper is on investikit.com.au. And this is all about the 10 cities that are likely to benefit the most from interest rates falling, right? Firstly, Jack, interest rates, what are you seeing out there? What are you thinking when you when you see like interest rates up, down, flat, yeah. sideways? What are you thinking? Well, right now, you've in the past couple of weeks actually, the one and two year fixed rates, even the three year fixed rates, the lenders are aggressively reducing them. Mm. And what they want is for people to go, oh, look at that rate. Let's jump on that. Mm. They want people to do that because what they're seeing, <laughs> well, of course, the, the banks are never going to lose, mate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that one way or another, they're going to get their money. So. If they're offering really low fixed rates, one to two to three years, like, come on, that, that means that the rates are going to come down mm. right? within that time. And they, they want you to fix your rates in today so that when the rates do come back down, you know, um, there are some cases where if you're doing a very high LVR loan, um, typically lenders would give you a really good fixed rate. And especially if you're buying with InvestorKit, if you do a very high LVR loan, you really only need to fix it for one year because mm. within that time that you own the property, the equity will get you to an 80% LVR anyway. Yeah. So if we're not doing that and then repricing after a year or simply doing a discharge form to get the lender to go, oh, no, please stay, that always works. And that's that's big. What you just said there is like gold. And yeah, like people, huge. you got to like rewind this if you haven't picked that up what Jack said. He talked about like one year interest rates, right? People mm. don't think like that. They think variable fixed and they just think longer term. Yeah. Like there's a power in just doing it short term because if your mm. property grows in value, you can refinance it at 80% loan to value ratios yeah. and you've got the whole playing field now. But you don't even have to refinance. That's the thing. You, mm. you can still, you can reprice. The, right. You can order a valuation, reprice the LVR. You can um, say to the lender, look, I'm going to refinance. True, because it's dropped from 90 to 80. Yeah. You can reprice yeah. it, right? Well, yeah. I'll give you an example, right? So you could do a 97% LVR loan yeah. and interest only variable, they'll give you like 8%, right? Disgust, <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> disgusting. But if you fix that for one year, you could get a six in front of it. 
Wow. Right? Which is which is where the variable rates are at eighty percent. Massive. For, for, I didn't a, know that. for an interest. Yeah. You, I mean, you don't get into the weeds. With, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. I with think that's like that's stuff. your thing. But man, we do. We've done that for many, many of your clients, and mm. and they love it. They love it because a lot of people think that you have to put such a big deposit down, or it's it's just ninety percent. That's it. Or if I'm going to ninety seven, I can't do interest only. It's not the case. Like it. Yeah. So that saves so much cash. Thing because yeah, you know. Man. Like, I think the biggest thing for people, right, if you can borrow it, right, mm-hmm. and obviously these people can in that in that example you've said, but if people can borrow during the high interest rate times, yeah, th- that means the stress test on that finance application was way higher than what the rates are today. Yeah. So you're good for it, yeah. right? But not only are you good for it, that if you can have the buffer aside, like you do when you go to those high LVRs at exactly. 95, 97, you end up preserving so much more of your cash yeah. You're in that position where if things do get tough or tighter, you've got a buffer. That's right. Because the worst thing a property investor can do is get so month to month and not feel like they've got that stash on the side that they feel comfortable with, right? That's yeah. one of the biggest things. It's made me feel resilient, like repairs come in, interest rates go up. You just look at the side and you're oh, there's a bit of a stash yeah. there. It's okay. So every now and again, you'll get a client who wants to be ultra aggressive, right? Mm. And you got 97%, bang, 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 every single time, no cash buffer, right? That's on them. Mm. But- what we find a lot of people that want to use that 97% LVR option is they just want to have enough of a cash buffer left over. Like yeah. rather than, cause that if, if you go 90% and you go to a certain purchase price, you know, say call it 600 K yeah, at 90%, they're all in. Right. And you know, even though they get a slightly better deal, they've got no cash left. So they're not comfortable to do All it. All the so taxes, one ear con, they're like, oh, yeah, uh, exactly. what's wrong here? Yeah. And then they'll reduce the purchase price and get a suboptimal property potentially. Mm. So if you just go the 97% LVR option, you, you've you got 20K left over. Mm. As Immediately, a that. that's a, that's a that's good enough. buffer against a house. That's enough. And you still get the, the that higher purchase price and, and the right property. So it's not for everyone, but... Man, it's it's um yeah, it could be a very good option for a lot of people. That's a good point. Um, now with interest rates where they are, and the prediction for many to come down, like how much do you feel that will impact the borrowing out there? Because you see capacities day in day out, like yeah, one percent, two percent rate ro- rate drops. Like things can move pretty quick, just like when yeah. they did in the the twenty twenty one period mm-hmm. where things came down, or even just leading up to COVID, even pre COVID, rates were falling down pretty quickly. Yeah, but if you if you look at all the predictions, um, and you mentioned that in the white paper that there most of the banks are expecting a one percent drop over twenty twenty five, which mm. is is good. That's mm. really good. Um, I don't know if that's super quick. I, I know it, it'll feel quick, but it's definitely not the knee jerk that we saw during um, the end of COVID, where they started increasing month on month. That yeah. was that was very stressful for for us and a, and a lot of people. Totally. Um, but one percent, you know, one a, a quarter percent drop every quarter, I think that's a really good outcome for a lot of people. And that's going to open up borrowing capacities by a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you don't know if it's going to be one rate drop every quarter. It, it could, you, you never know what's going to happen in the world. And you don't and know if it's like 0.25 or 0.5 sometimes. It could be different. Could it doesn't be always a knee happen. Jerk. Yeah. could be a knee jerk the other way. You never know. So yeah, it, it looks good. But from a borrowing capacity point of view, when the lender's started increasing their rates every month. I think they started to see a lot of the market share going to non-bank lenders due to borrowing power oh, constraints. Yeah. And what we saw as a result of that was a lot of lenders loosening their policy and simplifying their assessment to really open up what people can borrow. Yeah. So now I think they wanted that market share back, you know, <laughs> and they weren't getting as much lending. So they were able to take on more risks. So they started, you know, increasing the percentages of rental income they can use or, you know, simplifying their assessment on bonus commission over time and, and just being really generous with how much that allow you to borrow because of that. So it's a constant war, isn't it? Like they're, back they're and competing. forth between banks. Mate, like that. all those banks are competing. Mm. Our, our, the, the smart ones are. There, there are some banks that you'd be surprised that they're just not competing at all. And mm. they just, there's a, there's a few banks that are really focusing on the broker channel. Obviously, the amount of broker originated loans are massively increasing. And yeah. Some banks are, most banks in the broker channels are really on that and really trying to grow that. But other banks, you just think, are you guys even trying to get business or, Mm. but yeah, I think it's kind of balanced out because of all the rate increases. I think now we're seeing a lot of major bank lending and, you know, second, second tier, but good, good prime lending rather than a lot of non-bank lending. Whereas I saw during all those rate increases, there was a lot of, lot of non-bank lending just due to the fact that, 
they weren't ready for how significant the increases were going to be. And now the big banks want to claw back that business, oh, right? Yeah. So yeah. That, that's comp- competition is good. It's already happened, mate. Honestly, Ooh. like since the last rate increase, it's it's been about a year. So yeah. in even kind of before that, but in the last 12 months, mate, it's happened. Like the, the lenders have opened up their policy. They're quite happy to lend. And, you know, most, most deals are still with those prime lenders. And that's actually a really good point you raised because what people don't recognize is that you don't have to wait for interest rates for finance to change, mm. right? Like people think it's like, oh, interest rates down, then I'll be better. Like I always encourage people to keep the finger on the pulse. You know, we get our clients to keep checking in with you because when they keep checking with you and your team, it's like, hey, yeah, this bank's now changed something. Mm. That bank's now changed something. You raise a good point in that because over the last 12 months, even though interest rates technically haven't dropped, We've seen the fighting as if they're dropping already. Yeah. Fixed rates coming lower, some people policies changing, things like that. Man, a great example is, you know, three or four years ago, you could probably say one or two lenders would take one year financials. Yeah. Today, I, I, I could probably name you close to 10. So what's one year financials for those who are new to it? Well, a self-employed customer, you know, generally, historically, you'd need two years of financials. Okay, Maybe like one tax or, returns. Yeah, tax returns, uh, company company tax returns, individual tax yeah. returns, company financials or trust tax returns. Yeah. Um, you know, historically, most people would assume you'd need two years, right? But man, recently, it, it started happening over the last two years, but in the last year especially, there are so many lenders that are offering that one year in isolation financials. Mm. And, and you know, it's 20, You technically you can do 2024 tax return right now, but you can still use 2023 tax returns, which is, you know, almost a year and a half ago. Yeah. And you can use that for your borrowing power all the way up until March next year. Right. So if someone's <laughs> listening to that, they should think of two things, right? Firstly, the one year could be looked at from the year 2023. So if that year yeah. is looking solid yeah. and that's there, you don't have to wait to lodge this year's tax returns. You can no. use that. Secondly, if you're having some big growth as a business owner and this financial year June ending is gone like really, really well mm. for you, you could lodge the returns for that and isolate just that one year yeah. and get your servicing up. Uh, it's it's especially good for people that are in their second year of business. Got because it. in their first year, obviously you've got it's a tough. lot of expenses. Yeah. yeah, it's tough, man. And then in your second year, you'd obviously do a lot better, hopefully, than your first year. So, um, and that's just another way that those major lenders are trying to take the market share back because there's a lot of low doc options out there. There's a lot of alt doc lo- options out there. So yeah, they, they just, they want more market share. So yeah, they're just, there's a lot of one year financial options out there. Mate, the fight is on, the fight <laughs> is on amongst the banks. So um, I know you had a couple of questions for me on this report. So uh, for anyone tuning in and whether you're driving in the car, listen to this podcast, and you're wanting to go, look, I want to grab a copy of this report that we're talking through today. Just a reminder, it's investikit.com.au. It's totally free and it's called 10 cities that will benefit from rate cuts the most. Uh, it just dropped like literally this week. And if you're listening to in the recording, maybe, yeah, still this week because we're releasing this pretty soon on the podcast. Um, but this particular report, we might go through maybe three cities tops. Um, so that's me doing well, my, you know, seven for you to find out in the report, yeah. go, go get yourself a copy. It's totally free by the way. Um, but you had a few questions cause you checked yeah. out this report. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So what I, when I was reading the report, I noticed that you provided a, a lot of context prior mm. to giving those 10 cities. So I want to go into a, a bit of the context of what you provided. So in yep. the introduction, I'll, I'll, I'll read directly from it. It says yeah, yeah. cash rates in isolation will not bring another property boom across the country. As we can tell from historic data that not all markets move in response to interest rate changes. Yeah. That's a really, really good point. And yeah. um, not a lot of people know that because there's a lot of people that are sitting on the fence just saying, no, nah, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. And and I hear that and I just, I cringe because especially if you're buying through Investigate, mate, mm. I've seen some insane growth in yeah. just 12 months. And people that have been waiting for that long, uh, the, the opportunity cost is they wouldn't even be able to comprehend it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good point you raised. So firstly, that's an important line we write in the introduction because whilst this report centered around 10 cities that are going to actually benefit from rate cuts, it doesn't mean everywhere in Australia benefits from it, right? Because if the theory that interest rates dropping makes property booms, then why did we see markets boom as interest rates have been rising? Let me name a few cities. Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Townsville. Rockhampton, Bunbury, the list goes on, Bundaberg, Toowoomba, 
all of these cities, Barossa Valley, Mount Gambia, all of these cities have kept booming even as interest rates rocketed up and they've stayed high now. They're still booming. I bought myself a property in Townsville in, Adla in, um, in a suburb called Annandale. As per core logic, Annandale is up 27% over the last 12 months during interest rate highs. So that's really important to note. When interest rates drop and you think there's going to be this mad frenzy across the media, which there will be, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Yes, it will impact many cities, but it doesn't impact everywhere the same. Just like when interest rates go up, they don't impact everywhere the same. Let me give people listening in also the opposite. Interest rates dropped between 2012 and 2019 or 2021 massively, like mm. dropped like no tomorrow. During those drops, they got to like, remember those home loan days of 1.99% interest rates? Yeah, one uh, there was a few 1.79 at three, <laughs> three years fixed. I wish it was like the USA here where you could fix for like 30 years and then you're yeah. stuck forever. You're yeah. like, I'm never moving this uh, house. Um, but that happened and all the interest rates came down. And during that time, Perth didn't boom. Mm. Adelaide didn't boom. There were two, Perth declined by like 20%, mm. right? Adelaide didn't boom. It was flat. Brisbane was flat. Sydney, Melbourne boomed. Mm. Darwin didn't do anything. Hobart boomed and then came off as interest rates were declining as well for many parts. So why do you think Sydney and Melbourne boom? Is it because they're the most sensitive to the interest rates because they're the most expensive? They markets? have a level of sensitivity, no doubt, but it's more actually centered around local economies. Mm. Like local economies and local supply conditions do more damage in the good or, or the bad than interest rates in isolation. Like one, people, one, one thing people forget is that when interest rates rise, that's the sign of good times. It's interesting, right? Yeah. The mind's not wide that way because yeah. you think it's costing more, but interest rates rising is because the economy's pumping. Mm. Jobs are everywhere. Uh, people are spending money. And if they're spending, someone's receiving. Wages are likely going up in most cases. And that all happened this time. Job advertisements boomed, unemployment went down to the lowest, um, spending was increasing, like everything was going. Wage increases rocketed in the last couple of years. So like everything went good. Like, go figure, no wonder interest rates are going to up. So that's actually a good thing for the economy, right? Some cities have more sensitivity, but also when you zoom into the local economy, they just weren't as strong. Yeah. So that's kind of the big takeout. So I'm glad you raised that. Yeah, yeah. So in the white paper as well, you go through um, the markets that are, well, there's, there's a little table here that says that um, the last two years, being in a high interest rate market, the demand has shifted to more affordable markets. Mm. So in the white paper, there are some markets listed there, which you describe as currently overvalued, but if there was a 2% rate cut, you would put them in the affordable market category. That's right. Yeah. So what do you, what metrics are you using to dictate an affordable market? Yeah. So firstly, affordability is a really good question. Um, it's a skewed data set, right? It's very tough to get right. Um, we have our own way to look at it, but there's so many ways. Some people use yeah. price to income ratio, I think that's a stupid metric to use, but some people use it. Um, some people use, you know, just straight out repayments to income, mm. but they don't like break down repayments in different ways. What measure we used was A, taking repayments. Yeah. And when we take repayments, we're taking the median price of a city. We're taking an 80% LVR and we're taking interest rates at a 6.5% setting. Then what we did is we said, all right, that's P and I. So 6.5%. P&I, 30-year loan term, 80% loan to, loan to value ratio. Then to go on the other side, the income side, that's the expense side. The income side, we use a household income. And with the household income, we take 33% of that income going towards mortgage payments. Yeah. Now, when the median price of a city with that 80% loan, 30-year term, and 6.5% interest rates P&I, takes up more than 33% of the household income in that city, we deem it as overvalued, mm -hmm. right? Now, overvalued in isolation, just like interest rates in isolation, can't tell you a market's booming, right? Because there are some cities like all falling. Some cities like Sydney have been overvalued for like decades and yet they've done well, right? So yeah. you can't isolate that metric. Yeah. But in rate increase cycles, it was really interesting to see in the recent event, all the highest performing markets were the most undervalued ones. Yeah. Now, what we're saying in this data set is that there are some cities, so I'll give you an example. The city of Albury is currently 6% overvalued, right? However, if 2% rate, rate drops happen over the next, say, two years, 
all brewery in New South Wales is now 17% undervalued. Same thing goes with yeah. um, Wagga Wagga in New South Wales, 3% overvalued now. But if interest rates drop 2% over the next two years, as an example, they drop by to 21% undervalued. I, can't, I couldn't help but notice that a couple of years ago, you've probably been buying in these 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 markets. some of them yeah yeah before they were overvalued yes and then knowing that the interest rates are going to come down that's just going to help with more sustained growth in some cases yeah where their supply is tight so i'll give you yeah. some examples that are continuing their rise right now because the supply is tight bundaberg like bundaberg's got into now from uh, undervalued to fair value to just a little bit overvalued but still on a month by month level it's rising in value if interest rates do then the decline which we do forecast that to happen fairly quick over the next year then it just helps that affordability mm. at that city. But I think the main thing you should look at, Jack, is what about that chart on the right? You see that scatter plot chart? That yeah. to me was the most interesting thing. We looked at all Australian SA3s, so local localized mm. areas, and we looked at 22 prices. So 2022 prices, that's just as interest rate rises started to happen. And we looked at the growth over the next two years to follow. And we looked at what price point these cities sat at. And can you see how much the high growth rate was on the most affordable price points in mm. the country? Yeah. And then if you look to the far right where the more premium price points are, very little growth over the last two years. Yeah. So to me, that sparked something really interesting. You noticed it from your side as well. What did you notice on the finance trends the last two years? Because we weren't getting the same type of buyer inquiry at higher prices and you weren't getting the same type of finance inquiry, right? At mm. higher prices. What yeah. did you notice? Well, when the banks are, obviously you, you look at the actual rate for servicing, but they put a 3% buffer on it. Right. So when you're looking at higher valued properties and higher loan amounts with that 3% buffer, it's really tough to service that type mm. of loan. So it brings me to the next point because as rates, n another side effect of rates reducing, it's gonna bring first home buyers back into the market to be able to afford a higher valued property. Mm. Um, I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword though, because <laughs> when they start to buy those higher valued properties, it's gonna put pressure on price growth for those people. So yeah. they gotta try and just keep their finger on the pulse. Like if you are a first home buyer and you're trying to save up a deposit to get that, that higher purchase price, because a lot of people are struggling with it, especially where we are. Mm. The, the, the prices for houses and land is just so expensive. And mm. where the rates are right now, they're the ones that are most affected. Mm. And for the first home buyers that don't have access to property already and haven't had any exposure to growth, they've got to work the hardest to get in. So yeah, it's, um, it's tricky for them. Yeah, and I think like what you say is like also showed up in the budgets. I remember 2021 when we were working closely together, we'd see budgets, hey, clients looking for 800K to 1.2 mil, 900K to 1.3. Yeah. Like yeah. that stuff was fairly common or six, 600K to one mil. But then as the years went on, it's mm. like 400 to 600. Different, yeah. 500 to 700. That's for sure impacted the Are you, the are you reading rates. my notes, mate? Because <laughs> you flowed onto my ex the exact next point. Because That's crazy. Yeah. Well, with obviously with rates coming down, that's going to change the appetite for, for an investor. It's going to mm. put them in a position where they can borrow, but it's also going to change their strategies because mm. a, a lot of people, you're, you're right, so many people are just focusing on yield. They just really, really want yield. Mm. And that's because there's there's pressure on them right now, especially if they've got a, a lot of debt. The more debt you have, the more you notice the, a quarter percent rate increase. You might not think it's a lot, but if you have a lot of debt, you'll notice it. And that's why a lot of people are starting to ask for yields. But in a lower interest rate environment, they're not gonna be as worried about that. Yeah, fair call. I can remember you made me have memories of 2018 and 4% yields were, like solid back then. Mm. Then all of a sudden, three, four percent yields are like, eh, you know, like yeah. right now. Um, but yeah, what that scatter plot showed is all this growth happened in that affordable end over the last two years. Mm. And as we know, that can't stay the same forever. You know, you can't have an affordable end suddenly. You can't have Campbelltown be as pricey as Parramatta, mm. right? Because they they have to go through their waves of shifts because people will see value, intrinsic value, somewhere else. Um, so I think that's a big thing to look out for. Over the next two years, we see a big shift in markets as well, that as time goes on and the rates continue to come down, investors will be far more open to different areas rental yields yeah. that spreads the money. Also areas that have grown less will feel 
much more valuable to people because it doesn't feel as pricey and people can borrow more for it. Mm. And secondly, uh, thirdly, sorry, is that people who've made a lot of equity, they've made a bunch of equity yeah. in the affordable markets. So I'll give you an example. Out of Perth has rocketed 50 to 70% in the last three years in some areas. Mm. Inner Perth is about 20 to 40%. Wow. So it's like, it's nowhere near as high as out of Perth, which is really fascinating in the last mm. two years. So that's a big 30% gap. That means someone upsizing over the next few years, once interest rates start coming down, if they time things right, they could have a big benefit. Swing yeah. out the outside money, come into the inside, and they've got a house and a better location and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point to run into. Yeah, do a bit of a spiel on the white paper as well about consumer confidence elevation, which that'll, that'll obviously come with interest rates uh, decreasing to the masses, but to the property investor, I've already seen that come back. Honestly, yeah. ju just the mere talk of a rate cut, their confidence is back because yeah. they they all want to. They all think that uh, one rate cut is just going to be like, oh, property's booming, you know. And and two, it's like, oh, there's there's a mad rush again. So just the mere talk of it, the the savvy investors want to get in before all that happens. They should have been doing it six months ago, like I said, because th you, there's still markets that are growing rapidly, and you can still have a piece of that pie. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I've already noticed just just people hearing the word rate cut on the news they're like oh it's coming and and the confidence is back yeah you know you just made me get some memories then of like like i actually made a mistake on sentiment once in the past mm. what i mean by that is i didn't realize how important that was as a metric yeah so i was always looking at supply trends demand trends and then i was looking at certain cities that you know didn't do so well or did so well and i'm like why why not and and questioning myself and i've come to realize in recent times more than ever Sentiment is very, very, very important. Like, I'll give you an example. In 2022 in Brisbane, rate increase started happening. And there was this little, and anyone wants to check this out, just go to like sqmresearch.com.au, free source, great, great tool there for property listings data. You can click the tab free data. And then you can also just go into type in a, a area or you can, look for all all listings that I think that's what it's called um, and when you click on all total property listings you click on Brisbane and you'll see this curve 2021 2020 supply comes down heavily and then rate increases and a bit of sentiment shift in Brisbane and for that little period supply went up just like boom mm -hmm. it's like people just felt a certain way that things were happening because Brisbane's economy didn't erupt and explode and go bad just for that little period but just the thought the news the data the people saying this could happen and that could happen listings just picked up yeah and then you thought that okay Brisbane's booms over and it feels like that it regulated itself and then all of a sudden supply came back down again it's a yeah. really weird chart because usually it's a lot smoother but that train was like Rah! and then came back again yeah and then that was a explanation to me on sentiment right um but some cities, they're way more sensitive to that sentiment. And I'm still yet to figure out why. I wonder like maybe Sydney is like very sensitive from its data points to sentiment trends and shifts. Mm. I wonder if it's to do with like maybe how informed finance jobs, you know, what big about banks, debt all that stuff. Could be debt levels too, people's thoughts around it all. Mm. Um, but something in that sentiment data with Sydney plays a, a lot more impact there. But I guess the main thing to show in this um, data from a sentiment perspective is that confidence is boosting like you said already mm. right people are already looking at that interest rate that could potentially happen and people are thinking of it as if it's happening we're noticing in our client base our client base before even though rates haven't come down they're starting to open up and be much more open to bigger budgets we're looking at their data and we're saying hey you know 500 to 700 looks well and they're all like I want to be on 700 to 1 mil if I can. I'm like, okay, interesting. Talk to me why. He goes, Arjun, rates are going to come down. I'm like, see, like this is interesting to hear them say it back to me, even though we haven't said it to them. They're seeing that rates will come down. They're seeing that, you know, pricier markets haven't felt the love in recent times. And people are willing to just take that negative cash flow hit a little bit harder for that short period. And hopefully the slingshot comes back alive. So that'll be interesting to see if that actually happens. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to finalize for me, um, all the cities that you've, recommended i mean i'd buy in every one of those cities. that's <laughs> awesome and so if you could summarize why specifically you chose these because i'm sure you're buying in these areas as well 
Um, yeah, look, I mean, actually, we're not. We're not buying in all of them. We're no, buying in yeah. some. I, I, some of them you see. That. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So some of them we're not buying in. Some of them we are. This is just what the data says, right? Yeah. So I think the main couple of reasons for choice was this. So firstly, we looked at were they sensitive to certain changes in the past? Because there's no point saying a city that boomed during interest rate increases is now going to suddenly double boom because interest rates are declining. Like I know that that could help that city with a bit more finances and give it a bit more extra push. But like those that have had a complete opposite swing have been more important to consider. So if a city, as soon as interest rates start to come up, really start to go the other way, then its sensitivity is higher. And mm. if we look at past events, that's the case as well. So what we did is we looked at a few things. We looked at the affordability as aspect. We looked at the current market pressure. We looked at their rental returns and how the yields might change. We looked at their market cycle, as in which cycle position are they're in and what could that do when rates shift. We also look at their historic performance with correlation to cash rate changes. So how is it, how's it done when cash rates have moved in the past? Like how's that city reacted? And then from there, we also looked at their affordability trends and started to go, okay, how are each of these cities gonna do? So I'll give you one example of one that should be interesting. The city of Greater Melbourne. I think that's been a hot topic for many people. Now I don't want to say it because I don't want to give it away. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to give case. away. I'm going to give away. We'll, we'll give, you know what? We'll give away three cities. Yeah. Right? We'll give away three cities today. So the city of Melbourne's an interesting one. Mm. Melbourne's property market hasn't been pretty for the last seven years. Pretty poor performance. If you look at a ten-year data set, it looks decent still. Do you think that's purely from a policy point of view? Because a lot of people would say they blame it on the premier there. Yeah, lots of that has to do with it. It's yeah. like a multi multitude of factors. Yeah. It's uh, economic shifts in the mm. area. Um, it's past price growth in the area. It's the political environment. Mm. It's the taxes sentiment that played a big part there as well. Um, all of this stuff coming together is is leaving a bad taste in people's mouths. Yeah. Right. Um, so from all of these factors, though, we're noticing a few shifts. So the first thing here is monthly sales volumes are returning. And if we look right at the data, I think it's October 20. I'm just trying to zoom in on these charts here. I'd say what, double check, October 2023. That's it there, I just zoomed in. Eyesight's not the best, but mm -hmm. October 2023, September 2023, those two months seem to be when the sales volumes found its floor. So about late last year, sales volumes found their floor and have started rising. So for those not familiar with sales volumes, it's a simple review of transactions occurring which means Melbourne's transactions were declining year on year on year. Mm. And then around September, October, I mean, seasonality played a part in that floor, but it was a trend upwards and it's still going upwards. Yeah. So it means more people are starting to transact there. Second thing is investors are leaving a lot. Yeah. Now, if investors are leaving a lot, people don't recognize that's been a big part to play with the rental boom that's happening. Yeah. And it's actually extended the rental boom in Melbourne more than it has in other cities because mm. more investors are leaving. Because the land tax? Yeah, land yeah. taxes, um, compliance for rental, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, then we've seen inventory. It was rising a bit, which means a weaker market, but it's now started to flatten. Mm. Same with things like... Um, vendor discounting. Vendor discounting was rising up until about September 2023 then vendor discounting has been coming down. Days on market was rising heavily until September 2023, and then it's flattened. So Melbourne's at this weird stage. It's not on the cusp of a boom just yet, but it's at this weird stage where it's gone really weak, yeah. and now it's bottomed out. But that's the time you get in, mate. That's because exactly that's when it. you don't have to negotiate with 10 other buyers. Like, try, <laughs> try and buy a property in Perth right now. Yeah. It's a bloody nightmare. Like, it's tough. You have to do cash buy, or you, you just no finance clause. Like, that's why if you invest counter cyclically and you get in early enough, you, you don't have that same competition. You don't have to keep going up and up and up on, on what you're offering. You can get good. Absolutely, man. Yeah, good terms. A absolutely. You just got to be aware that like um, booms don't happen overnight. Remember, property markets are slow moving. What I yeah. mean by slow moving is, yes, we've seen a boom happen recently, but they're like long transactions. They're not share markets where overnight someone popped some news out and overnight everything's gone. Yeah. They're 60, 90 day settlements, 42 to 60 days. There's yeah. months of decision-making offers missed out on a few mm. open homes that started with five people, jumped to 10, yeah. jumped to 20. So you got time. So, but yes, from a buying said aspect, we think interest rates will make a positive impact to Melbourne 100%. Um, and it'll impact it positively there. So that's one city. Well, the most common thing that people say when they're considering investing in Melbourne is the the low rental yield. That, mm. that is the, the very first thing that comes to mind for an investor. 
And that's only so relevant now when we're in a high interest rate market. But yeah. I'm sure once they start seeing the capital growth that they'll, they'll all flock. Well, check this out. Rental yields in January 2023 were 2.8% for Melbourne. Ouch. Ew. They've jumped up already, even without interest rates, to 243 uh, 3.43. Yeah. So that's a 0.6% yeah. jump. 0.63. Uh, and is that a combination of price decline and a little bit of price decline and flatness yeah. and then the rental yeah, j- yeah, jumping yeah. up so spot on um now here's where it gets interesting we break down in this report you actually also get to see the cycle positions of the city in terms of what it's done over one year three years five years seven and ten so over the one year melbourne hasn't grown at all over the three year it's only had an average of 3.8 percent per annum over the five year three percent per annum over the seven year, 3.9% per annum, and over the 10 year, 5%. National averages are five to 6% long term. Mm. So you're looking at this and you should be looking and going, that's seven years straight of below national average performance. And in Melbourne's 40 years of data, like it's maintained an overall above national average of performance. Yeah. So if it's maintained that over 40 years, we can talk about the concept of that reverting back to its long term averages. Doesn't happen overnight, but interest rates will definitely play a part there. So there, yeah, it's one of the three cities. And are you sure you're giving this all out for free, mate? <laughs> yeah, man, totally. You should put a um, section in there <laughs> people can donate, mate. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> donate, pledge, pledge for Arjun and the research team there. No, look, um, all free. Investikit.com.au and it's the property research tab. Just click that. Um, and it's 10 cities that will benefit the most from rate cuts. Um, so yeah, that's one of the cities. Now I won't go into every single data um, point, but two other cities to call out Sunshine Coast. Mm. That's, we expect that to improve. And another one is obviously be silly not to mention Sydney. We Mm. expect Sydney to improve as well with the prospect of rate cuts. So these are three cities. There's seven more. If you'd like to check out the report, go grab it from investikit.com.au. It's totally free and investikit. We do this like every month. Um, There isn't any other uh, buyer's agency in the country that puts out research reports like this or that frequently in that depth and totally for free. I actually see a lot of other buyer's agency companies using your white papers. (laughs) We we had a really funny story. I've got to tell you this. So um, one lady, lovely lady, she actually went on board with another company. Yeah. And she was in the presentation chats with them. And they were sitting there and saying, hey, you should buy this house and land package in this area. Yeah. It goes Townsville. They're like, you should totally go here. Uh, and this was a couple of years ago because we were one of the first in the nation to spot that, you mm. know, picking up. As always. Uh, thanks, dude. Uh, and then um, we spotted that and we said, hey, this is the research paper of, you know, areas that are prone for growth and things happening. And then the guy with the house and land package pulled up our research paper and said, hey, here's Investigate's research paper and here's what they said and here's what Townsville will do and here's how it will go. And so the next day she was making a decision. She called up our team and goes, hey, I hadn't heard of you guys before. Mm. Um, but I'd seen your research paper when someone else was talking to me about their house and land package. Can you just help me directly? Well, yeah, sure can. And so, um, we had a chat, we've helped her buy a property there and that's gone up over 35% in just that time. Yeah. Uh, but the main thing is like, yeah, you're right. It's, it's all over the country, this stuff here for yeah. free. And just to be clear, you guys don't buy house and land packages. We don't, yeah. we don't buy house and land packages at all. Don't want anyone to get the wrong. No, idea. <laughs> they did that. We bought a, that's we bought right. a freestanding established there house. There we go. Just to be clear. Um, so Jack, that's, uh, that's basically it for me on this report. But before we go, this is the first time me and you joined forces here on the podcast and we got many more episodes ahead. Um, but people would have heard your story today, would have heard your insights into the finance space. I personally know you've helped many of our clients and continue to be their choice. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you, learn about your business as well and spell out your website too because yeah, you know, people yeah. spell, that, so, spell that wrong. fouracrefinancial.com.au. Uh, that's my name, Jack Fouracre. Uh, F-O-U-R-A-C-R-E, exactly how it's spelled is how it's said. Are you, are you one day going to get acreage one day and have four acres? That's just the goal. To like, is that uh, the goal? If, if I've got enough, <laughs> more money than cents, I, I, I'm sure I'll do some stupid like that. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. Now, look, Jack, thank you so much for being on the show. Team, um, if you're listening to this, uh, get in touch with Jack. Uh, from a finance perspective, he's changed the lives of our clients, helped them go from one to three to five and beyond. Um, their team's great. Uh, I'm personally working with them as well. So from that perspective, you know, reach out to Jack's team and you'll be in good hands. Thanks a lot, man. Mate, looking forward to the next one. Me too. Game over.